Ignatius Press and the Augustine Institute present The Formed Book Club. Catholic book lovers unpacking good books chapter by chapter. If you like us, please help us by subscribing and by reviewing us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you might listen. And don't forget to sign up for weekly updates and study questions at formedbookclub.ignatius.com. Welcome to another episode of the Formed Book Club. With Stephen Dudro here with me at Ignatius Press, Father Fessio, Joseph Pierce joining us from South Carolina. We continue our discussion of Henri de Lubac, SJ's wonderful book, The Drama of Atheist Humanism. Uh, we are completing, we hope, uh, today part one called Atheist Humanism, which in chapter one we took Feuerbach and Nietzsche, chapter two, Nietzsche and Kierkegaard, and then chapter three, the Lubach points out that because of what happened in the 19th century, uh, there's a special characteristic that we have of our spiritual battle. There's always a spiritual battle, but the spiritual battle now has taken on a little different form after this attempt to construct a humanism without God. So we were in the final chapter of this section called The Spiritual Battle. We concluded on page 122, where a new section starts, The Spirit of Christianity. Joseph, I now will turn it over to you, our fearless leader. <laughs> um, well, yes, it's starting on page 122. I, I wanted to point out first the fact that uh, Henri de Lubac uh, does a, a, a show Baudelaire, so to speak, and, uh, and turns the finger and says, et tu, hypocrite lecteur, a new hypocrite reader, because he says here, do the unbelievers, bottom of page 122, do the unbelievers who jostle us at every turn observe on our brows the radiance of that gladness which 20 centuries ago captivated the fine flower of the pagan world? Are our hearts the hearts of men risen with Christ? Do we in our time bear witness to the Beatitudes in a word while we are fully alive to the blasphemy in Nietzsche's terrible phrase and its whole context? Are we not also forced to see in ourselves something of what drove him to such blasphemy? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, again, I, it almost speaks for itself. But the, but the point is the great the greatest enemy of Christianity is the scandal caused by Christians. And uh, you know, all of us do that up to a point when we sin, some of us more scandalous than others, but it's because we do not, we do not live as true disciples that people like Nietzsche get a foothold. You know, if, if, we were, if we were the living saints that we're called to be, you know, nobody would listen to philosophers like Nietzsche. And there's two aspects here of what de Lubac does. It is, it's common in his writing. Number one, he does really outline sympathetically the challenges that are brought by others, and therefore doesn't just write off Nietzsche, mm -hmm. but tries to understand what he's really saying, what value there is in it, and why he's doing it. And that's number one. And number two, in recognizing the truths or basic facts that underlie some of these criticisms of the church, he gives us the solution. What are we to do? Uh, and that's where, I mean, I find... Both aspects fascinate me. One, he's so able to get into the soul and the mind of these other people, and at the same time, be a guide for us in how he tells us what we should respond based on that. It's just, it's, I find it very beautiful. And I, it goes with the task he's given himself in this section of the book, that it's a task of discernment. So... At the same time that we're discerning what's going on outside of ourselves, we should also be exercising discernment about what our own uh, spiritual growth requires. And I just appreciate that we are learning here from really not just a great intellect and a great mind, but really a great souled man and a great guide, spiritual guide, who can actually help us be better Christians. Oh, man. Well, he, I mean, yeah, he, again, he says just below that, uh, you know, he's putting he's putting into uh, 
he's paraphrasing Nietzsche's position, the position of other atheist humanists. The Christianity of today, your Christianity, in other words, our Christianity, is mm -hmm. the enemy of life. That's ironic because it because it is itself no longer alive, right? And again, you know, we, how Christianity has to be alive. And then, and then he quotes this Jacques Riviere, and I love Paul Claudel's. Uh, response to Jacques Riviere there. You know, Jacques Riviere says, basically, no one cares about your Christianity. It's dead, right? Dead and dying and decrepit and uh, irrelevant. And Claudel's response there in the middle of page 123 is, truth is not concerned with how many people it convinces. Um, yeah. But he goes on, de Lubach, that is, because that's the end of Claudel's quote. But then de Lubach goes on and says, but... If those who have remained faithful to truth have apparently no virtue, that is to say, no inward strength, does that not seem to justify the surrender of others? And what really hit me here was how much we need one another's fidelity to continue ourselves. You know how uh, it's 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 a contagious thing: despondency and complacency and. And so, but I also, and I'm sure you're going to take us there. He's not talking about the kind of strength that is a counterfeit to Christian strength here. And, and de Lubach is very discerning about explaining what he means by strength, right? But I'll let you lead us there, Joseph. Well, when okay. We... I'm, not, I'm not sure I would be, by all means, you, you lead us where we need to be if I'm not leading you there. But I, I would, I would say <laughs> what, you know, one, one very, you know, I, I started off by quoting Shaw Baudelaire with, you know, uh, the, the true hypocrite, like true hypocrite, hypocrite reader. That of course, when there is a discrepancy between truth and virtue, that's the, the, that's because we are hypocrites, right? If we know what the truth is and we're not living it, we're hypocrites, and that's what the problem is. And people can see how our hypocrisy, and when they see our hypocrisy, it scandalizes the truth. So I don't actually have personally. I don't actually have anything else now until uh, until 129. So I'm probably not leading you where you want to go, Vivian. So please take us there. Oh no, because that's um, not till 129. I don't um, have anything for that. Okay. What about Father? You might have well, something. 27 for me. Okay. Um, I can see a lot of. I know. There. Don't don't let that. Uh... Well, I do like the fact that he reminds us that on the bottom of page 125 and the beginning of 126, just to be realizing what it is that we're up against, that the Nietzschean project really is the, to, it's the figure of the crucified on one page, page 126, top of the page. It's the figure of the crucified that is rejected. So for all of the fault finding that people outside the church can do, you're hypocrites, you're, you're, you're indolent, you're complacent, you're conformist, you just go, go with the flow because this is, you know, how you were raised or the group you're in, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and while that might have some merit and it's good to hear it to stay on our toes, De Lubach is not fooled in that he knows very well that this project is a figure of the crucified, meaning Jesus himself is rejected. Jesus, the one who lived the Father's will perfectly, is rejected. So, yes, our faults can be used against Jesus, but at the end of the day, what some of these atheists are doing is their scorn is heaped on Jesus himself. Well, especially yeah, I mean, the I mean, you've heard me say this. We've been doing this book club for so long now. You've heard me say this many times, but you know, that quote from the priest character in the Morris Baring novel that the acceptance of suffering is 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 the secret of life. I think that the rejection of the crucified Christ is is the rejection of suffering. Right? That that's that's the point. Is they do they, they the mystery of suffering is something which they are affronted by. Uh and the acceptance of it seems to be somehow a surrender to some sort of tyranny. Um and, and I think that's the problem. Well yes and the Nietzschean idea is not not just suffering, that part of it, but the fact is that Jesus is a loser. Yeah. You know, I mean, he, he didn't start, he didn't lead people to some great glorious you know, rejection of the Romans or lead a group to somehow revolt against, you know, whatever was wrong in society. No, he suffered. He was humble. He, he spent, you know, 30 years in obscurity as, you know, in Nazareth. Uh, that's not the 
heroic ideal of the Nibelungen lead or the, you know, of, of Nietzsche or Wagner. And so that's the rejection of the crucified Christ. We, we, we don't, we want to be overmen, supermen. We don't want to be worms, you know? Right. Yes. Right. It, yeah. Completely missing <clears throat> that God's willingness to endure evil in our hands and offer us forgiveness through that is the way that we come to repentance. And it's the greatest heroism and the greatest, of all. greatest love of all. It is. And, but also, and that is the very pride that Nietzsche and, and others uh, idolize, which is the cause ultimately of the suffering. Yes, yes. That's the irony, right? That's the irony. Yes. So I want on 127, mm -hmm. about six lines down, because here is the response of an academic who's used to abstract things, you know. What needs to be done is something quite different from what we went before. Christianity must be given back its strength in us, italicized, which means first and foremost that we must rediscover it as it is in itself, in its purity, in its authenticity. In the last analysis, what is needed is not a Christianity that is more virile or more efficacious or more heroic or stronger. It is that we should live our Christianity with more virility, more efficacy, more strength, and if necessary, more hero heroism. But we must live it as it is. So let's not just talk about what Christianity is and the importance of it and how great it is and how strong. But no, no, we have to interiorize that, assimilate that, and live it. By the way, I, I'm a hypocrite now because I don't do that, but at least, <laughs> at least not to the extent I should. But, you know, the famous saying that that, that uh, hypocrisy is the tribute that vice plays the virtue. Yes. That is, I mean, I, I realize we should practice what we preach. But you know something? I'm going to preach the truth even if I don't practice it because it's the truth. I may not come up to it, but I can't not proclaim it. Now, that may make it hard for people to accept it as the truth, but the point is I can't use the excuse that, well, I'm not going to preach the truth because I'm a sinner. No, no, no. By the way, a parenthesis on that. You know, you heard this thing about in the spiritual life, if you're not moving forward, you're moving backward. Mm -hmm. I deny that. I think it takes a lot of effort just to say the same. <laughs> That's called treading water. Exactly, treading water. <laughs> or the survival float, even, where all you're doing is lifting up and taking a breath and going back down, <laughs> which is even less energy. It, it, uh, it, might, it, it might cause scandal to each ones, and it, uh, but it's, <laughs> it's better than drowning. Yes, it's better than drowning. <laughs> But of course, you said you've got something on 129, yes. Joseph, yeah. because right, right I want to get yeah. to uh, still how uh, de Lubach goes another step further in explaining to us that if this strength were to quicken in us, as it should, that this is what we're talking about. And he gives us a list of the things that would be recovered in the Christian who was living Christianity. Were you going to... That's well, on 129. Please, I, mean, uh, please uh, I, so I've, I basically uh, highlighted quite a bit about heroic Christianity and heroism, uh, gentleness and goodness, those passages on 129. But please take it. You, you take it on board. Well, that's, that's exactly what he's saying because he's so concerned about there being a false ideal of strength, which is what uh, fascism and Nazism were, were doing and, and people were being subducted by it. Christian people were being subducted by it. Seduced. And that too, seduced. So yeah, isn't that a that word? A word? Okay. It should be. It should be. It's well, a neologism, and you can claim it. It's it means like a sub. In, in it's like a, it is subduction. It's when a, it's a, uh, it's 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 a it's an undermining. It's yeah. a it's a it's a but seduced too because they're seeing the the posters of the strong working men and the beautiful blonde wives and beautiful perfect children and we're gonna rebuild and be strong and all this kind of stuff. And who, yeah, who doesn't want that for themselves, for their families, for their country, and so on, right? It's a very seductive thing. And de Lubach is trying to be so discerning about, oh, let's not be seduced by something very superficial. Let's well, look at what real, yeah. what real Christian heroism looks like. And he gives us this beautiful list on 129. Starting where? At the bottom of the first page paragraph with the word gentleness 
Go ahead. Yeah. Here are the things, gentleness and goodness, considerateness toward the lowly, pity for those who suffer, rejection of perverse methods. Not sure what that refers to. Well, yeah, yeah it, it is not trying to bureaucratize it or, you know, have a the victory of the proletariat oh, or okay. communism in order to bring up the poor. No. Those are perverse it, methods. Evil means to a good end, right. Okay. Protection of the oppressed. Unostentatious self-sacrifice. Resistance to lies. The courage to call evil by its proper name. Love of justice. The spirit of peace and concord. Open-heartedness. Mindfulness of heaven. Those are the things that Christian heroism will rescue. And this so-called slave morality, which is what Nietzsche called the Beatitudes, and so on. All this so-called slave morality will be shown to be a morality of free men and the sole source of man's freedom. Oh, Amen. I, I, I highlighted the whole of that. So, uh, uh, But I did also, about, when he talks about heroic Christianity and heroism, he says, uh, if you like, parameters of, of that list, which follows, uh, about eight lines, ten lines down on page 129. It will consist, above all, in resisting with courage in the face of the world and perhaps against one's own self the lures and seductions of a false ideal and in proudly maintaining in their paradoxical intransigence the Christian values that are threatened and divided. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, then I'll go to the very bottom of the page in the last sentence or so. But whatever happens... Christianity will never have any real efficacy. It will never have any real existence or make any real conquest except by the strength of its own spirit, comma, italicized by the strength of charity. Mm -hmm. Now notice there are no footnotes on this page. Why not? Because after carefully analyzing Nietzsche and Kierkegaard and seeing the mistakes and recognizing what's but we need to take cognizance of what they say. Now comes the Lubach himself, mm -hmm. you know, the beautiful man, the saintly man, telling us what it really means to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess just one thing, Father, as well, because uh, uh, the one part of that paragraph you didn't uh, read, <laughs> I think is also important, and he says right at the beginning of it, Christians have not been promised that they will always be in the majority Rather the reverse. Now I think that connects quite nicely with Paul Claudel's you know line: "Truth is not concerned with how many people it convinces." You know that we, we uh, probably we, we we all have think in 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 our modern Western world have this sort of we've been poisoned in some sense by one notion of democracy that something is only valid if it wins an election. In other words, if you've got fifty one percent behind an idea, it's a good idea. If the if the other idea only has forty nine percent, it's a bad idea. Whereas of course, truth is not about what the mob. Uh, in whatever numbers uh, 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 ascribed to any one moment. And in, and what he reminds us of there, and actually throughout history, you know, that the, the, the true Christian virtues of and the cru Christian heroisms always, for the most part, been in the minority. The saints are always outnumbered by those who are not saints. Uh, and, and generally speaking, those with power are those who are persecuting Christians or the church in some way or other. So it, 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 this whole idea that we should expect to be uh, um, uh, a minority that's, that's that's being crucified. They have crucified me. They will crucify you. They persecuted me. They will persecute you. So, are you opposed to synodality, the kind of democratization <laughs> of the church, where all the faithful have a voice? Is that what you're? I, I, you're a I monarchist. I know you're a monarchist. No, maybe not necessarily. <laughs> Read the Lincoln Douglas debates. Lincoln was not a monarchist. He was a republic, true, you know, a champion of the Republic of the United States. And those debates are how the majority can rule evil. Just because you've got 51% majority doesn't mean that the idea that they are ascribing to is correct or true. And he was, of course, debating uh, Douglas, Stephen Douglas, taking the Confederate side. Well, we all want slavery down here, so... Who are you? This is majority rules. Who are you to tell us what's right and wrong? And that's what those debates are about. And anyone proposing the synodality for the church or monarchy for America ought to read those. Okay, oh, good idea. <laughs> uh, yes. And also because of the 
the all omnipresence, not just of God who's omnipresent, but of the media and social media and its control by a limited number of people mm -hmm. that majorities can be swayed yes. very easily by propaganda. Well, uh, notice how first they first the artillery to soften up the enemy and then they take the pole. You know, so it's like this, it's like the artillery barrage and then the infantry come in. And that's exactly what the media does. They go on and on about certain stories over and over and over again. And then they take the poll. Yeah. Of those who've listened to the story. Yes. Yeah. And that, of course, is there a surprise that what the poll shows is that a majority of respondents have agreed now with what they've been hit with. Night after night after night after night on the nightly news. When when when, when you when you are genius enough as a Salwan to put a palantir stone in everyone's house, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's not surprising that we get skewed results. Well, um, even more genius if you can carry it in your pocket wherever you go. You're yes. never away from it, you know. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So. Yeah, we concluded the spiritual battle, that yeah. is to say the chapter, yes. not, not the battle itself. And guess what? We're, we've done a half hour almost, so we can stop oh, this this, and well, go yeah, on to the next. We've only got 20 minutes, I think. Yeah, only 20 minutes. We started at, at 10 after the hour. Oh, okay. But it, anyways, it's a nice stopping point, and then we can start on the next section. Okay. Well, let's do that. Let's give people a break with a shorter thing. And if you don't like it, they can write letters and complain. <laughs> All right, we'll see you all for the next session. God bless you all. If you enjoyed this discussion, please help spread the word about the Forum Book Club by subscribing to the podcast and writing a review. You can sign up for weekly updates at formedbookclub.ignatius.com.